right, okay. Here we go, right. So 100.4 slides, seven minutes, here we go. Um, so, um, my, hello, my name is Doug Falshaw, and offline I look like that, and online I look like that. I'm gonna hear, talk to you about e-learning today. In fact, the title of this presentation is Everything I Know About E-Learning. Really, it should be called The Stuff About E-Learning That I Can Put Into Words Amongst the Random Thoughts and Voices in My Head. That's not so much of a snappy title, really. Um, I currently work for JISC InfoNet, but five weeks ago, I was still working as director of e-learning up in Northumberland and Ashington. Um, ten sites, 3,000 kids, 500 members of staff, that type of thing. Before that, I was e-learning staff tutor in Doncaster. Sorry, and I've taught many apologies. And for the last six years I've been teaching history. The first thing I want to talk to you about today is that e-learning doesn't exist. Um, really, we should be talking about learning with ease, but that's not this. We're talking about in terms of duty of care. E-learning is really part of this nebulous thing that we call learning. Really, we should be working towards a situation where we're talking about blended learning, um, and then we can drop the E from e-learning, just in the same way that kids below the age of 20 don't really talk about digital cameras. So learning is something that happens in your head, really, more specifically in your brain. Um, and technology is something which is often used to try and end up with better assessment targets and exam results. But really, that's the wrong thing to do. And I know there's a disconnect between um, the assessment regime and what happens in schools, but us being like dogs chasing after shiny cars isn't really going to help anyone. Technology is often used as a shortcut, or, or being thought of as a shortcut to um, learning, but really it's not like that at all. Technology is about new learning experiences. And quite often I hear about people saying we need to teach Facebook, and oh there's all these new literacies that have come out that we need to be teaching kids. I write my thesis on this at the moment, and I could bore you for hours on this. But really, I see it as being like a rehash of the argument that we need to be teaching Microsoft Office to all kids so they can all be nice little businessmen when they leave school. Well, I think that's a fallacy. And the reason for that is because we don't really know what the future's about. That's not to say that internet safety and, and good practice online isn't an important thing. It's just the fact that the economic argument doesn't really make sense when we're talking about a more holistic education. It's like trying to put together two just random stuff, training and education. The second thing that people say is that we need to be using students' own devices, the, student, the devices they already own, for learning. And that's all very good in, in further education, higher education, because they're kind of consumers, they're customers, and that's what they do at the end of the day. But I don't think that's a good argument for schools, necessarily. Can you imagine being that kid in the class who hasn't got the latest and greatest phone, and is kind of socially excluded because of that? Are the learning gains that you're coming across really good enough to counteract the social exclusion that they're gonna experience? It all comes down to money then in the day, and I think that's one of the two biggest problems in education, because there's been lots of cash being kind of ploughed into education worldwide, but really it hasn't been spent wisely. I'll give you an example, interactive whiteboards. We put interactive whiteboards in every room in every school, and kind of a one-size-fits-all approach, and that's a really good thing to do. But people teach differently, and people certainly learn differently. So I think that's a bit of a wrong-headed approach, really. It's like giving everyone exactly the same thing all of the time, because then we're treating people equally. Whereas actually, we need to be treating people equitably, which means that sometimes you can treat people differently, otherwise it's a bit unfair. There's a flip side to all this, and the flip side is that sometimes people don't really know what they want. They don't know what to do with stuff. Um, which is why democracy is a very good thing, but sometimes benevolent, di benevolent dictatorship is a better thing to do. It's like giving people huge amounts of choice without actually them knowing how to choose. Um, if you're interested in this, by the way, I'm reading a book called Nudge at the moment, which is all about choice architecture. It's a really good book, so I suggest that you read that. If you're interested in finding out what people think, then I suggest you go about constructing a survey. And I like to think that JISC Infonet, who I currently work for in further and higher education now, um, are really good with surveys. But you have to know what you're trying to find out. It's not just good at asking random questions and expecting some kind of good answer. <laughs> For example, you have to know what people really want. I'll give you an example of that. When I was director of e-learning up to five weeks ago, um, I introduced Google Talk as part of Google Apps Education Edition. Now, if I asked people through a survey, do you want an instant messaging survey in your business life? They would have looked at me like this and gone, well, obviously not. Why are you mad? I use that at home. But actually, it had quite a deep impact. Um, and it kind of sat between email on the one hand and phone on the other hand, and it kind of had a life of its own. <coughs> and that people started using it across the 10 sites of the academy really quite effectively. 
And the reason for that is because communication is like the water or the lifeblood of every organisation. It allows you to focus on what's important and it means you can bring people together because people are the, the biggest resource that you've got in education. <coughs> Another thing which I think is overlooked in education is um, the concept of design. <laughs> and I think there's two parts of this. First of all, there's the physical environment, like we're now, but there's also the digital ecosystem. With the physical environment, um, this is kind of nodded to in things like BSF, but you end up with kind of learning spaces which look like learning spaces of all we've always looked at. You need kind of holistic environments where the blended learning and the digital <coughs> and the physical is all blended together into something which is more than some of its parts. With a digital ecosystem, instead of having some massive document on functional specifications about how everything's equal, instead of that we need to focus on kicking apps big style and <laughs> focusing, instead of just functional specifications, about something which is going to actually transform learning, like Chris has just been talking about. So next time you're in a planning meeting, and someone says, oh, functional specifications, send them back to 2005 where they belong, and um, think about jigsaw kind of pieces coming together into a bigger picture so that everything is seamless for the student. I think we need to think about channels of learning and about mixing things so that student experience is the best it possibly can be. I'd love to have time to talk about the brave new world of mobile technologies, which I'm researching for Jessica at the moment, but unfortunately all I can say that in this amount of time that I've got is that if you're not investing in things which are mobile, then you're doing something wrong. Um, and I think there's two reasons, just to finish off, why we're still talking about e-learning in 2010. And I think the first reason, um, out of the two reasons, is that kids love technology. We know that. Um, and the second thing is that e-learning can be like a Trojan horse for new, new, for new things. The first one about kind of um, kids loving technology, I have to be really careful about, because for example, I really love red wine, but I wouldn't go and drink it in school. And we give certain kids Ritalin to calm them down, but it doesn't mean we should be handing it out to all of them. You have to treat kids differently. Otherwise, if you just focus on kids loving technology, it will sometimes lose-lose situation, where it's an ever-diminishing kind of situation. We need to be defining learning goals very, very quickly. So if you're doing that at the moment, I suggest you get some learning goals in there. The second thing is Trojan horses. E-learning can be like a Trojan horse for a whole raft of pedagogies which can transform the learning experience. Because on the, on the one hand, you're either forcing people to confront new ways of doing things, on the other hand, you're forcing them to duck the issue. And trust me, they can't duck the issue for very long. Let me give you an example. You can give kids mobile phones, or let them use their own mobile phone cameras to be able to document what's going on in schools. And there's no reason, really, why they shouldn't be walking around and using their mobile phones appropriately, um, instead of kind of using pen and paper all the time. And the reason why we don't do that is because we're scared and we don't like losing control. Another thing is like using 3G um, data connections to circumvent um, Wi-Fi and filtering and everything like that because we're scared that we're going to look at porn, but actually what they're probably going to be looking at is checking that what you've been teaching them is the right thing and that you've <laughs> just been making sure that, you know, actually this Mr. Bell show isn't crazy. So what are you going to do? Are you going to confiscate what they're doing? Uh, or what are you going to do? Are you going to just stick your head in the sand and just ignore that it's there? Which option are you going to take? Are you going to confront it and try and make it better? So I think there's only one way in which you can get rid of the E of e-learning, and that's through communication. We need students talking to teachers, talking to communities, talking to businesses, talking to Ofsted, talking to awarding bodies. And the good thing about communication is that technology is very, very good at doing that. Thank you. Yeah.